Yeah, new way of taking notes these days. Right, exactly. Exactly. So, um, so should we get started? Yeah. Sure. Excellent. Well, Michelle, it's really nice to meet you. Um, Claude and I were really looking forward to this for a lot of reasons, not just because um, you and Lawton both have UC Irvine in common, um, but um, yeah, Lawton and I are co-founder at, at ChemTalks, and today we want to talk to you just about um, your, your job and, and your research and, and what gets you excited about, about working in the field of chemistry and then some you know, maybe some piece of it, pieces of advice that you would have for people who are thinking about chemistry, you know, at all different levels, whether they're in college or, or high school and in, in, in middle school, um, sure, things like that. Um, but if, uh, I, I guess one way to start out is, is if, uh, how would you describe your, your, your job to people who were, were students and thinking about science and, and teaching as a, as a career path? What would you tell people that, that, um, that you do? So I tell my students that my job is to take science students and turn them into scientists. Um, and so to help students sort of see beyond just science as a bunch of facts to think about, or even a bunch of techniques to learn, but sort of as a, a mindset and a way of being in the world, um, to be curious about the world in particular ways, and to think about the ways in which chemists in particular, you know, try to answer those questions about the, about the world. Um, and I mean, most students know what it means to be a teacher, but I think in particular to be a teacher at the level that I am um, as a professor at a college or university is to really think about taking students from the sort of last moment you're a student to the first moment that you're a professional. But your, your job is more than just teaching and inspiring, right? There's also research and there's also writing for Nature magazine. So like, right, for the last few years, how much of your time, like what percentage is actual teaching related and research related? Right. Every once in a while, somebody asks me how much time do I spend on each of these things? So you're right. So a portion of my job is spent in the classroom and the laboratory working with students um, in that way. And then there's another portion that's the research work that I do. And for that, I have a research group. So there's students that are being mentored. So that's still part in some ways of the teaching, right? Of taking students who are science students and turning them into scientists. And, and part of it is just satisfying my own curiosity about how does the world work. Um, my big interest is in molecules that misbehave. So molecules that have structures and properties that chemists would not expect them to have. Um, so that violate sort of the rules of what chemists understand molecules are able to do. And, um, and I, you know, enjoy kind of the surprise of that all, um, but it also has real, you know, impact to structure and the ability of a molecule to do something are very tightly related. Structure and function go hand in hand. So understanding structure is critical to understanding function. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the research end of things. And then I love to write. And so I do that. Um, and I write this regular column for Nature Chemistry, but I also write books and other other things. So, so is there um, is there an example you can give of a molecule that people may be familiar with that that misbehaves in some way, either in its structure or reactions? Oh, that people might be familiar with harder because um, molecules I tend to work or, with or less are familiar weird. with, or if they're less familiar with, that's okay. Uh, okay, here's one that people might be able to easily visualize or make a model of. So you can take a strip of paper, and if you put a twist in it and tape it together, you get a Merbius strip. Mm -hmm. And it turns out you can have molecular Merbius strips. These are kind of interesting to chemists, among other things, because they're handed. There's a left-handed form and a right-handed form. And for biological systems, being right and left-handed is really important. And the mo molecules that people might be familiar with are the taste of caraway seed, like rye bread, mm -hmm. and the taste of spearmint. Those are the same molecule, but just uh, mirror images of each other. 
And of course they taste completely different. Your body would never confuse those two molecules. And the only difference is that they're mirror images. So it's a really critical biological function. These Merbia strips, in fact, can you make molecules that have this same topology and they have this built-in handedness, right-handed, left-handed. And trying to understand, um, they have a weird property in that the twist tends to all get tangled up in one spot. Um, and so trying to understand why and how to control um, sort of the amount of strain in the molecule is something my group's been interested in for a while. We think we pretty much got it solved and we're moving on to other problems, but, but that's one you can build your own, you know, your own model of and see for yourself um, that you get this weird kind of collection of the twist. Hmm. Um. My taste buds definitely pre prefer the uh, the spearmint and antiomer of, of carbone, <laughs> um, not the uh, not not the mirror image, the caraway. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about when you when you say that there's <laughs> very different forms. Yep. My yep. Mouth I mean, reacts. <clears throat> right. I mean, uh, to me, it's fascinating that such a subtle difference in some ways can have such a huge biological effect. And I mean, and that's, you know, handedness in biology goes hand in hand with function. Right. And function. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing is, is that they have different chemical and physical properties, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's both. Yeah, well, they have very subtle, different chemical properties. You know, they boil at the same temperature. Um, they end up, um, you know, density is the same. A lot of the physical properties are in fact the same between the two enantiomers, which means that separating them once you have a mixture is really difficult. Right. And so the preference chemically is if you want just one of these Im mirror images, you should just make the one mirror image. That's kind of the holy grail of synthetic organic chemistry. And that's, is that, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's where, <clears throat> biology comes into play right because i know biological systems are inherently very good at you know yes. selectively producing one you know one hand over another right you know they produce yeah. you know either an l or an r right? one or the other right but right the right handed it, version right right and um and in fact biological systems do this <laughs> it's a little bit of a pun, but they do it naturally. Um, and, you know, the best chemists, we have to kind of kludge around it to get it to do that. But if you can design a protein to, you know, churn out molecules, um, you can churn out exactly what you want. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So, you know, so my interest really is around these kind of odd structures and trying to understand, you know, what's the interplay between topology, geometry, and um, molecular structure. Right, that's, that's a very important and very important field. Yeah, I mean, and you know, it's, it's a huge field in, in chemistry to think about structural, structural problems. Um, and it, it gets tackled by quantum mechanics, it gets tackled by people doing crystallography, it gets tackled by people doing nuclear magnetic resonance work. I mean, the number of things you can bring to bear on it is kind of um, amazing. Right. So one thing that we find that students want to know is what what kind of of degree path do they need if they want to do a certain career? Like so for yourself, can you take us through like what your undergrad degree was in and, and what your graduate degree was in? Boy, I'm a chemist through and through. So I did my undergraduate degree at UCI in chemistry and then my graduate degree, my PhD in chemistry at, at UCI. Um, and I'm gonna say that if you wanna do the university professor route, that's what, you, that's what you need. You need the PhD and then typically a postdoctoral fellowship afterwards. So right. after I finished at um, UCI, I did a postdoc at Princeton um, on, the, on the, that's how I ended up on the East Coast. Um, and, but if you wanna do some of the other things that I do, so for example, the writing doesn't require the PhD. Right. Um, and there's lots of fascinating careers for people who are able to understand the science, but also help other people make sense of it. Um, and so that kind of chemical communication or science communication is I think an even more important field 
now than it was maybe 10 years ago. Um, a lot of important problems, everything from the you know current coronavirus pandemic to climate change, where people need to understand something about the science. Um, so there, that point, you know, the bachelors will will do you. That's interesting about climate change. We're putting out a um, infographic with our ChemTalk seven favorite moments in the history of chemistry, and one of them is is when we realized that that CO two levels were were rising in the atmosphere. I believe that was in, in 1960. Um, right, the, the history of that is really pretty pretty fascinating. So um, Sherry Rowland from UC Irvine was my freshman chemistry professor, but then also on my PhD committee. Um, and so, you know, I remember taking a graduate class in atmospheric chemistry and you know, Sherry showing us that graph of the increase in CO2, and that would have been in like 1980, um, you know, and you could already begin to see that, that rise in Mauna Loa. So do you remember what first sparked your interest in, in chemistry? Oh, I read all the science fiction when I was a kid, and, you know, the notion of like all the sort of wild things you could do with science was really attractive <laughs> to me. Um, you know, and, and I read biographies of scientists. Um, my mom gave me a biography of Marie Curie um, one summer when I was really sick and I spent a month being incredibly sick. And as I was recuperating, my mom just brought me a stack of books. And one of them was a biography of Marie Curie by Eve Curie. And then another was a biography of Eugenie Clark, who was a marine, um, marine biologist. Yeah. And, and those sort of got me all fired up about being, being a scientist and discovering new things. Um, so, and I never, and that passion has never left. That's great. That's such a great biography to read. I believe the Curie family is the most prolific family when it comes to number of Nobel prizes. If right. you add it up for the for the total number of people in the family, they're at the top of the list. Right, because Pierre Curie has one, and Marie has two, and their daughter Irene the daughter, has, right, right. has one. Right, so. Um, there's the Pattersons. Is it the Pattersons? No. Um, oh, who has, there's a father-son pair um, who has a Nobel Prize, and now I'm thinking on it. It's about the electron. Um, why am I blanking on the names? Um, but the father got it for showing that the electron was the particle and the son got it for showing that an electron was a wave. And Google would probably reveal it to me in a second, but. <laughs> uh, It'll but come back it, to you when you least expect it. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be in the middle of a lecture and I'll think, oh, that's it. <laughs> um, but, but yeah. And I mean, I wrote a piece for major chemistry about Marie Curie and sort of actually a couple pieces about Marie Curie and our fascination with Marie as kind of the iconic woman scientist. And, and to the point where people I think can't see any other woman in science. Um, somebody posted a, photograph on Twitter and there was an unidentified woman in it. It was from a physics conference. And so people were like, who's this woman? And people kept saying, oh, it's Marie Curie. Yeah. And, but right. Marie Curie was dead for like 15 years when that conference yeah. picture was taken. So um, definitely not Marie. Um, and so, you know, for all the love I have of Marie Curie, there's also this, you know, she get she takes on a larger than life. Um, right, right you know, size, size when you think about who, who does science, um, who are the women doing right. science? We, we actually, it's, it's funny you mentioned <clears throat> that, we noticed the same thing and we chose Lisa Meitner as the first mm -hmm. historical female chemist to, um, to profile in our History of Chemistry series, just because I felt like exactly what you said, that even though Marie Curie obviously has amazing accomplishments that it's almost oversaturated and that, that people should have additional role models and understand 
what these people went through and, and, and their successes and also how they were, they were hindered in their, in their uh, quest for, a con you know, to get recognized for their accomplishments. So Lisa Meitner yep. was a great choice for us. Right, Jimmy, she's, she was pretty much robbed of that Nobel Prize. Pretty much, yeah. Um, she, and, she, and I, she and Ida Nodak was another woman um, who had discovered an element, but Ida also had, um, had some theories about nuclear fission um, and she also got left out of the literature. Um, so, you know, Nuclear fission was, some people say, was discovered three times, twice by women. And when finally right, the men agreed that it was, right. it was okay. Third time's a charm. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, like like isotopes, the guy who got, um, Frederick Nadi, who got the Nobel Prize for thinking about what an isotope was. But Stephanie Horvitz, who was the person who actually proved it, nothing. Mm. And, most, and most books don't even mention her name. But she's the person that did all the work to prove that isotopes actually exist. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. You do all the heavy lifting only to have it stolen from you, basically. Well, he came up with the idea and she went off, you know, to, to see if he was right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and of course, and he was, you know, Frederick Soddy was right. But, um, but to me, what was interesting is that she just goes unmentioned. Right. Um, and that most of my students, you know, some of them may know about um Saudi, but very none of them will know about Stephanie Horvitz. So right. So speaking of your students, how, how do your students, when you first your students are in their first chemistry class that you teach, how do they tend to view chemistry? Like do they is it so, are they all chemistry majors or do they think a chemistry is difficult or are they afraid of taking it? Like how do they seem to perceive it in general, most of them? I think the answer is all over the map. So oh, one thing yeah. to know is that Bryn Mawr is a women's college. So all right. my students are women. Right. And um, the intro chem classes are small compared to many places. They you know, total maybe 100 students um, taking, taking intro chemistry every year. Okay. And um, we offer only one flavor of it. So there's, you know, if you're going to major in chemistry, if you're going to be pre-med, if you're just taking this to satisfy the lab science requirement for the college, uh, you're a biologist, everybody takes the same chemistry all the class, same. all in the same place. So I have people in there that are nervous because you know a lot depends on this. They wanna to go to med school and they know that getting, you know, getting this yep. material mastered and getting a good grade is really important to them. Some are really excited to become chemistry majors um, geology majors take that course and, um, and hope to hear some of the sorts of chemistry that they're interested in. Um, so there, it's a mixture of curiosity, anxiety, um, and excitement, I think, yeah. that my students, students kind of come into the classroom with. And for the students who maybe are not excited, what, what do you think gets students excited about chemistry? Like what what do you do or wish you could do to get these students more excited? Well, well you know, I think part, this part of my job is to get people who aren't so terribly excited about chemistry to help them find the chemistry that they can be excited about. So part of that for me means picking examples from a wide variety of fields. So from medicine, from food chemistry, that's a, that's a way in for a lot of people to get excited about chemistry. It's about the chemistry of food, the chemistry of the environment, um, the chemistry of the earth, um, astrochemistry, you know, what's going on up in interstellar space. Um, I have colleagues at the Vatican Observatory who work on meteorites, so, you know, what do we, what can we learn about outer space from the meteorites that hit the earth? And that's chemistry. Um, so for me, it's telling exciting stories to students that the, you need to understand the chemistry to be able to understand the story. Um, and so I try to really teach things in context and not just, hi, this is the definition of pH um, right. or, this is the definition of an acid, memorize it. But um, you know, why should we be thinking about acid-based chemistry? Um, what might that have to do with what happened in Flint, Michigan? Um, so there are issues, you know, for some students that are very passionate about social justice, understanding you know, that clean water is a huge issue um, mm -hmm. and one which chemists contribute um, and chemical engineers 
um, contribute a lot to making sure that people, you know, have clean water. So for me, it's, it's really about making sure that the broader context of chemistry is visible to my students. Right, right, right. That's great. So if, if someone said that they wanted to be a college professor of chemistry, what additional advice would you give them other than to major in chemistry and get a PhD in chemistry? I think if you want to be a professor, in some ways, it's a little bit like being an entrepreneur, because you're going to have to be raising your own grant money to fund your research. Um, so you have to enjoy that kind of entrepreneurial bit. Um, you have to like writing because that will be part of it, writing grants, writing papers. Um, you need to do that. You need to enjoy mentoring younger scientists, I think. Um, so it's sort of an odd skill set. Um, but one, I found it incredibly satisfying as a career, but I think that that mix of the fact that I enjoy writing, that I enjoy trying to figure out how to, you know, pitch this to the, um, to a grant agency to get, you know, funding for it. And that I really enjoy mentoring younger, um, younger scientists. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and you need to be, you know, really curious, um, I think. To, uh, to be in that role of a, of a college professor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, you can't stop learning. That's the bit, you know, right. because your students, you know, if I just sat back and said, well, I learned everything I needed to know about chemistry in graduate school and now I'm all done. Um, my, you know, your students are constantly pushing you by asking questions, the field is changing. So you need to sort of, you know, have that kind of ongoing curiosity about about things um, if you're gonna teach at that, at that level. So are you saying that chemistry did not stop happening in the 1950s? <laughs> no, chemistry is happening even <laughs> as we speak. Um, if you wanna have fun, you could go look at, I mean, so this is for the students, um, go take a gander through Chem Twitter um, to see what chemists are up to. The Royal Society had a great poster session earlier this year that was all online. And you could see what, you know, chemists are up to and doing. A lot of the stuff had great animations that go with it. Um, chemistry is a pretty visual field too. So right. um, if, you know, the visual attracts you, then it's also another exciting, exciting place to be. Um, yeah, I mean, at, at ChemTalk, we think, chemistry is amazing and there's a lot of great stuff going on every day but when I was talking to a U U U UCLA nonprofit panel and I asked people about their favorite chemist and there were 75 people on the call they all thought of someone and, and I said well are you 75 people how many of you thought of someone who is alive and the answer was zero so this seems to be a trend that people only can think of chemists who were alive a long time ago. And, and do you think that's acceptable or, or is that something that maybe we should think about trying to change? Oh, definitely. We should try to change it. Um, it's interesting. Scientists aren't any better at this. Two women did a study of asking um, scientists to name 10 women scientists. And most of the living or dead didn't matter. And okay. the scientists couldn't do it either. <laughs> So, uh, which is, which is, important. I, I wrote, I wrote a piece that at the end of which um, I made 10 living and dead women scientists. Uh, so that the next time someone asked you, you'd know the answer. Um, but part of it, I think, is that um, people's awareness of what's in the news, sometimes people right. aren't, they don't right. identify them necessarily as a chemist, but right. you know that mRNA vaccine that um, we're all very excited about. Yep, that's um, the one I got. Yeah, that's one I got too. And in fact, one of my students worked on the project. So, um, you know, that to me was very exciting um, to see how chemistry played a really important role in getting that vaccine um, developed and, packaged um literally you know in the little right, right, the right. little packet that gets injected into you right you know that's that's chemistry uh, you know I mean? and so so to me you know there there do we know the name of the woman you know who did that work right 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 you know a lot of people don't realize <laughs> there's a lot of stability work and you know stuff that goes along with packaging 
it's not just the mRNA you have to worry about. You have to worry about how to keep it stable in a solution, which is a whole mm-hmm. other, you know, issue in and of itself, you know? So. Right. No, I mean, packaging is, you know, and then, you know, the packaging itself has to be resistant. So if you need something that needs right. to be kept at those really low temperatures, you can't keep it in something that's going to become so brittle at those temperatures that you can't ship it. Exactly. And, you know, so there's chemistry and physics and material science kind of oozing out of just even that one, that one place. Um, but we tend, when we, I think, read the news stories about it, we get focused on the technology or the, the chemistry and not the chemist. Um, right. And I think that's, that's a piece of why people miss the kind of magic of chemistry um, in all of this. I feel like maybe 20 or 30 years ago, you know, people would have wrote an in-depth story on how, how the vaccine was made, the process, you know, the story behind the scenes and talked about these people more in depth. And um, you still see that kind of writing in more professional journals, but not in, in the everyday newspapers as much. They, well, it's because they've been stripping out the science desk at most newspapers. <laughs> um, and I mean, the Philadelphia Inquirer, so where I live, used to have a dedicated science desk, you know, with dedicated science reporters, but no longer does. Um, and, you know, arguably science is more important now than it was a decade ago. Um, right. the, New York, the New York Times does, the um, Washington Post has a really superb um, science section. Um, but that's really few and far between. And yeah, I think yeah. that's part of the reason we don't see these, you know, more in-depth profiles. Yeah, that's a shame. That's because I, I think that's, that is going to be a really exciting story that people are going to tell about the race to, to create this packaging and testing it and, and the, the chemistry and the pharmacology and everything behind it. It's incredible. I mean, to me, it's incredibly exciting, even for what else it portends, right? I mean, you can think about, um, you know, what other things you might be able to develop a vaccine for um, using the same technology. You know, can you make a vaccine for HIV AIDS for this? Um, If this were some horrific, you know, thing with a huge fatality rate, you know, we could have rolled this out even faster than we did. I mean, most Mm -hmm. of the time was in safety testing. Yeah. um, And not in the development. So if this were, you know, cataclysmic event, you know, this gives us the technology to respond, you know, very, very quickly. Um, And that's kind of, that to me is really exciting. Oh, yeah. Um, So yeah, I think I think we will see more. um, And I think, you know, there's more writing in longer form these days. So there are more books being written. Um, So there's like Super Heavy, which is about the race for the the, uh, post uranium elements by Kit Chapman that's just fabulous or Deborah Bloom's um, The Poisoner's Handbook. You know, so those are two really exciting books about, about chemistry um, that if people are looking for things to, things to read. Um, I'm writing and- this down because I'm, I'm obsessed with having a great list of chemistry books to recommend <sighs> to people other than, you know, the, 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 the standard disappearing spoon and um, so I'm gonna, I mean, the disappearing spoon is a great is a great book, but but, um, but that's Deborah, always recommended, right? Right. right yeah. Yeah. yeah but Deborah, Deborah Bloom's The Poisoner's Handbook is about forensic chemistry. So it's like, you know, the um, and she's a, a great writer. I mean, boy, I read that book and there were moments I'm like, oof, this is like, you know, crazy scary in places. Yeah. Um, so that would be, a, you know, I mean, I'm always giving my students kind of a reading list at the end of Gen Chem for the summer reading for chemistry. That's fun. Um, so. The um, speaking of poisoning, which, which can be a fascinating topic scientifically, the, um, the Russian agent who was poisoned by polonium a few mm-hmm. years back, initially they thought it might've been thallium because his hair was, was falling out. And the day before he died, they x-rayed him and they, you could see the shadows in the x-ray on his stomach from the Prussian blue that had, that had stained it, that they gave him to treat the, the thallium. And um, it's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like, I don't know what the right word is, but it's, um, it's like, yeah, the day he's about to die and here's the Prussian blue and nope, that was not it. That was 
a, a, right, the, a, a, right, they a um, uh, uh, misdirection, you know. Right, the missed thing. Yeah, no, in, in the Poisoner's Handbook, she talks about thallium poisoning, and that's pretty, pretty interesting. If you want to talk to another chemist who does really cool stuff about crime, Rachelle Burks at the American University, um, whose handle on Twitter is Dr. Rubidium. She writes the column for Chemistry World about forensic chemistry, and she is- yeah, Dr. Rubidium, I've seen, I've seen her, her, her stuff for sure. Yeah, yeah, but she, I mean, she goes to- uh, science conventions to, um, and works, she works with middle schoolers. Um, she's really, she, she'd be a great interview. That would be great. Yeah. So we've agreed that, that the, the news has changed in the last 20 or 30 years and they've, they've changed their, they've gutted their science departments. Do you think the overall perception of chemistry by the public and by, by students has changed in the last 30, 40 years at all? It's, you know, it's kind of hard to know. I think certainly in the, there was a moment when chemistry was kind of viewed as um, the savior, you know, that science would rescue us from all these, all these issues. And that was maybe, you know, the fifties and early sixties. Right. And then, you know, sort of at the period when, you know, anything chemical was bad, right. It was mm -hmm. polluting. And I think maybe the pendulum was kind of swinging back that we, kind of understand that chemistry has both solutions and problems for us. Um, although I still think that chemical has a bad, um, leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. For right, certainly. Of, you know, and so I sometimes, I wrote a piece for Slate about chemophobia. You know, people's yes. just kind of fear of anything that sounds, sounds chemical. Um, and occasionally I give, give talks about that to public groups, you know, why, you know, how, what, what sorts of things should you know about chemistry so that you can understand what the risks are, even if you're not the chemist? And so things that like structure and function matter, the name of something doesn't. So people will say, oh, if your third grader can't pronounce it, you shouldn't eat it. But that has nothing at all to right. do with whether it's safe or not. <laughs> right. um, and so, you know, sometimes, and, and then other people say, well, it gets used for something, you know, awful. So the food babe will go on about how oh, something gets used in yoga mats and it's also used right. in bread. So it must be terrible. But I just point out that there's, you know, a substance called oxidane. It's the primary uh, compound in um, human urine. And it's also a taste enhancer in coffee. We drink it. People are like, nope, no way. It's water. It's the technical name for water. <laughs> and, which is something it's something very few chemists know because chemists just call water water uh, but but actually it's IUPAC name is oxidane That's uh, um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, which is I, which is crazy uh, we have a chemical free household so I'd like to have some oxidane free water personally <laughs> Right, right. You know, the number of people that would like things, you know, minus chemicals, and it's like, well, that's just not this, not a possibility. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, just telling people that, oh, it's, you know, everything is a chemical doesn't really help. And so part of what I do is I really want people to understand, you know, what are the things to think about when you turn think in terms of risk, that dose is important. Right. Um, right. And, that, um, you know, don't let people kind of distract you with, oh, it's, you know, got a complicated name or other things, um, or to confuse you and say, oh, this is all natural, so it must be safe. And natural and safe are not synonymous with right. each other. Um, one... So, you know, helping people kind of sort it out. Yeah. There's those raw natural almonds that contain cyanide and it's natural. And if you eat one, there's really no harm done, right? And if you eat a hundred of them, you may be feeling a little differently about your natural almonds. That's right. right. And, yep. So, and yeah, and, and that sort of, you know, misunderstanding, I think, about risk. Um, is something that people make money off of. I mean, that's the other thing I exactly. when I, give this, when I give this talk, I tell people the one thing you should look for if you're looking at a website that's trying to tell you or scare you about something is does it have a little button in the corner that says buy? <laughs> if they're trying to sell you something, you should probably take them with a grain of salt. Right. And people do it all the time because I mean, 
unfortunately, our society as a whole is just chemically illiterate. I mean, it's really yeah. what it comes down to. And it's yep, yeah, really, it really is that we're somehow not communicating to people about you know how to understand the world um, through through the lens of chemistry. And um, so, you know, I wander around and I, you know, I go to libraries and I give this talk about, you know, what you should know about chemistry um, so that you aren't, you know, uh, fooled by some of these kind of pseudoscience purveyors. Right. And I mean, the food babe makes millions off of you oh, know, yeah. scaring, scaring people about stuff. You know, she talks about, um, tomato soup that's MSG free, but tomatoes are a huge source of glutamate and she adds salt to it. So there's tons <laughs> of MSG in that. She's, right? adding and, toxic, she's adding a toxic chemical, sodium chloride. Well, that too. Um, but she and I once had a conversation. She, um, I wrote the piece, she was offended. Um, and then um, she wondered if I would be you know, open to having a conversation, which we did, which was relatively cordial. Um, but it's clear that she's, you know, got no interest in actually understanding the, the chemistry. Well, and because she's making too much money. Yeah, she's making money. Right. Yeah. Well, Michelle, I know you have a, a one o'clock meeting, so I'll just, um, four o'clock your time. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll just have four more quick questions. I'll, I'll, sure. I'll wrap up. Um, one of them is, so, so we, we know that chemistry is perceived by some people as chemicals are bad. And how, how do you think we can change and improve the perception of, of chemistry? I think that when we tell the stories about chemistry that we can make sure to help people understand what's behind our statement that something is safe or not safe. Um, and, and to sort of continue to make the point that structure is what matters um, and that dose matters and to help people understand those two risk factors in particular. So, um, so what we do here at ChemTalk, we're a, a brand new nonprofit that four of us started. And our mission is to change the perception of chemistry by making it more fun, easy to learn, and more accessible to people around the world in the safest manner possible. We, we believe that people can experience chemistry at some safe level whether it's, 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 you know, pouring gallium in their hands or, um, you know, doing an experiment with aluminum foil or just, or just reading a story or, or a book. Um, so do you have any thoughts on, on this mission and do you have any advice for us? I think it's a fabulous mission. And um, I would encourage people to um, think about the, what's happening when they cook, I mean, cooking and chemistry are closely related to each other. Um, and to think about, you know, why is it that you're adding acid or salt or these yeah. things um, or sweet um, to something and to think about how that, that works is makes chemistry a lot more fun. Um, and there's lots of, you know, things written about uh, molecular gastronomy. Yeah. Um, so there are fun things you can, you can make. Um, and, and that's a little chemistry, so. Speaking of, of cooking, one of our one of our favorite experiments to recommend that that people and families can do is to take your baking soda and cook it in the oven at 450 degrees for an hour. And when you pull it out, it's no longer sodium bicarbonate. You have sodium carbonate, which itself can lead to a large number of really great 100% safe experiments that family can um, families can do. And it's interesting, we, we see very few people talking about that, even though it's so simple. We're, we're uncovering lots of nuggets of, of fun, safe experiments people can do. No, that's, I, I did lots of those things with my kids and their friends when they were growing up. Um, some of them, you know, they're now all you know, graduated from college, but somebody said, I remember we came to your house and we extracted DNA. <laughs> yeah. you know? um, and yep, indeed, you know, we put, let's, peas in the blender and which, you know, made wonderfully colored things. And indeed we pulled out, you know, strands of, um, of DNA. Yeah. And, um, and now, um, I think the, the excitement of doing it yourself is. Right. Well, a, a lot of people now have distractions of, of video games and social media and TV, but um, 
I, I remember doing a lot of science when I was young and, and at ChemTalk, we're working hard to put science back into everyday life, again, in a safe manner. That doesn't mean that, you know, you need to be, um, you know, making mercury chloride in the, in the kitchen, but there's a lot of amazing <laughs> things that, um, yeah, you, 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 know, yeah, you, you definitely, can, you can do. You definitely want to be, you definitely want to be safe. One of the experiments I did growing up was try to separate oxygen and hydrogen yeah. um, electrolytically <laughs> from water. And of course the test for it is to put a little, you know, burning thing in and we blew up the, um, uh, the big ball of kind of hydrogen floating above the sink <laughs> and it singed my brother's eyebrows. So I definitely <laughs> recommend safe. But I think people need to keep things in perspective that even doing that kind of experiment is so much more safer than driving to school or going down the street in a skateboard or, yep. or swimming in the ocean. I mean, if you look at the actual or going on a trampoline, the, yep, yep. Um, the accident rates of most activities that people are encouraged to do, even singeing yourself with chemistry is many, many times safer than these, these other things that people are encouraged to do, so. Oh, yep, nope. I mean, there's, there's a, I, there may be something online, and this is a fun thing to go look at, which is the Chemical Heritage Foundation, which is now the Science History Institute, which is a museum in Philly, has an amazing collection of chemistry kits um, and, um, and the, they've looked at how they've changed over the years, you know, yeah. from the times when you had the radioactive things in them to now, um, when, you know, there's nothing that you can't feed to your little brother without, you know, fear of anything. So, um, and I'll see, I'll see if I can find the link to it and I'll send it on to you guys. Cause it's this one. Oh yeah. Like that <laughs> one, like the Gilbert, K look at that. And the boys I are doing it. it right? old, uh, at like an old uh, antique show. It's from like, I think 1959, I believe. Oh, yeah. No, it's those are like one. fabulous. <laughs> yeah, those are, those, are, those are old. And they have this huge and fabulous collection. I was a fellow there and it was great to be able to, every once in a while they would take a bunch out and we could play with them. Um, oh, that's so that cool. was, it was totally, it was totally cool. So yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, my advice is what you already know, which is get your hands dirty doing chemistry. That's what makes it exciting. Well, that's yeah. what we like to hear, and um, that's what uh, that's what we're going to try to encourage people to uh, to do. And if it's something that um, that can be absorbed through their skin, we'll tell them to get their hands dirty with some good gloves on. Yep, that's 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 <laughs> yep. the thing. And as yep. as always, wash your hands. <laughs> yep. Yes. So last two questions, besides Dr. Rubidium, who's someone that's currently working in a chemistry field that, that you look up to? Uh, well, she's certainly somebody who's, who's up and coming. Um, Sherry Rowland, who's, who's now passed away, was somebody who I really looked up to as a, as a chemist and who is really incredibly fabulous. Yeah. Um, trying to think of other people who I think are just kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, and Matt Hardings, who does chemistry of food, is pretty is pretty fun. Um, and um, oh, I heard a great talk by um, Kelly Chacon, who's in um, where is she? She's at Reed, I think, um, and who is interested in you know kind of the weird ends of the periodic table, but their biological effects. Um, and so she's like a biochemist who's interested in kind of the parts of the periodic table that you think biochemists ought not to be interested in, like, right. you know, sometimes right. even including the lanthanides. Yeah, um, that's what, that's so, the first group that came to mind when you said that. <laughs> yeah, she's, 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 she's pretty cool. Um, and who, who's another, maybe I can think of one more cool chemist in all of us. Um, who else? I think you have Stuart Cantrell, who's the editor of Nature Chemistry, who's an editor these days and not a chemist, but um, who worked on some of the molecular knots. Um, so that kind of work is pretty, um, pretty, pretty cool. Um, and there's, who else am I thinking about? That will probably do yeah, for now. Yeah, that's a good list. That's a great list. Um, I, I, I follow Stuart on, on Twitter and yeah, he, he has a lot of great posts and a lot of great food related posts and chemistry. Yeah. Gin related and to be specific. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, have you gone to one of the socially isolated socials? What's that? Have you gone to one of the social isolation socials that I, Stuart's I, been not, running? Not yet, no. I, you should go. I need to do that. Yep, sign up and go. They're really fabulous. I need to do that. <laughs> and, and there's, you know, you, you should sign up too lot and they're really great. And there's I'm down a, to all, try it, yeah. Sure. Yeah, there's always a wonderful mix of people on. And so um, it's been it's been good. And Michelle, what's your favorite element on the periodic table and why? Oh, my favorite element is aluminum. And nice. in part because it's, you know, sort of so 1960s, 1950s, which is when <laughs> I was born. Um, and also because it does some really cool and fascinating chemistry. And when I was um, a young professor, I did a lot of um, computational work on looking at some of its structural stuff. And it does some really right. fascinating things. So. Right. Um, so my, my favorite, hands down. That's great. I mean, even just touching the surface of aluminum, literally and figuratively, right? It has this amazing 50 nanometer passivation layer of aluminum oxide that's right, yeah, literally yeah, yeah. formed at the speed of light. Like how amazing is that? Right, it comes with its own protective coating. Yeah. Which is right, but if you is, scrape it away, it, it reforms before you're even you're even right done with it. Like yeah, no, I mean, it has great material properties, and it it does some really wild chemistry, and it has an incredible array of um, structural forms it can take. So yep. you know all these sort of aluminum oxides with crazy geometries, um, and it's catalytic. I mean, it's a great element. Yeah, it's an underrated element, that's for sure. I think so. And is there anything else you want to tell uh, you want to tell uh, anyone who's watching this uh, this this video? Or I I have had such fun understanding how the world works with the eyes of a chemist. You know, I love being able to sort of look at something and in my mind's eye see underneath underneath the surface. You know, to hold a glass of water and realize that those molecules are forming and reforming all the time, um, that the little protons are falling off and you know other protons are coming on. I love that notion. And I love the notion about the fact that those protons that are in there were most of them made when the universe itself was made and they're like 13 billion years old. And there's just something so incredibly cool about having the eyes to see that. So um, become a chemist and get you know that superpower. Yep. Yep. Laden, anything else on your end? No, I think she, she hit the nail on the head. Yeah, there we go. Let's do chemistry. Michelle, this has been so enjoyable. I, I, I feel like we could probably do this for, for a, a, a couple more hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. I could we talk need for to have hours. A part two. <laughs> I think we need to have a part two. Well, we could we could do a part two, and maybe, maybe I'll send you a couple of the pieces that I wrote about um, some of the things we talked about. So. That, that would might be, be fantastic. Fun. That would be great. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that might that might be fun, and um, and good luck with the project. I'm curious to follow it as it as it goes, and um, and it's nice to make more UCI connections. So thanks so much. We, we we literally have just launched. We're just getting started, and really we're just starting to form the team and 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 find other people who are interested in in being part of Chem Talk and changing the perception of of chemistry. So you're you're literally seeing our, our birth. Uh, 